into day three of the immunology marathon. Uh, any questions or any points anybody wants to raise? Anything you want to do differently? Some students were complaining that we're going too slowly. <laughs> so if anyone thinks that, just raise your hand and I'll uh, speed things up. Okay. There's always one, right? There's always one student like that. You know, the one who's memorized all the slides already. You know. Okay, so uh, today's lecture, and you know, now as the course is going on, we're going to be getting to a lot more pragmatic aspects of immunology in terms of functional activity, and I think really starting to get into some of the subtleties of the regulation of the immune system. And today, and uh, uh, we're doing uh, four lectures. Uh, the first lecture is going to be T cell immunity. The second is a continuation of how T cells see antigen and how they kill cells. The third lecture is going to be mucosal immunity. And mucosal immunity, I think, is really an important lecture because it's extremely relevant to understanding mucosal transmission of HIV and other infectious agents and how the mucosal system is able to deal with it. And one thing that is important to understand is that the immune system is very, very different in different locations. So the immune system in the mucosa is really v its own system that's very different. And you can't apply the rules of the immune system when we think about lymphoid tissues, lymph nodes, to what's going on in the mucosal tissue because it has a very different activity. And the fourth lecture is going to be a lecture on HIV. And the lecture, it may go a little bit longer than an hour, because I really wanted to pack a lot of information into it to really kind of give a broad overview of HIV infection and how it interacts with the immune system. So it really should be uh, an action-packed day, but one I think that is going to really start being very relevant in terms of your own understanding and your own work that you're doing right now. So questions to consider. Uh, first question, and because of the fact that these pointers have a very short half-life, uh, uh, I have to use them very sparingly. So uh, the first question is, how do T cells know where to go? And that is really an amazing question when you think about it, because T cells have to go all over the body, and clearly you want the appropriate T cells to go to the appropriate locations. T, uh, clearly, for example, free T cells coming from the bone marrow have to know to go to the thymus. If they go to the lymph node before they've undergone VDJ recombination and selection, you know, who knows what would happen. For also, once they are in the thymus, they have to know they got to leave, they have to go to lymph nodes. After they've been activated, they have to know they, go, they have to go to home to the site of the infection. We've already touched upon how that happens in the first lecture, using ad how adhesion molecules play that role. But again, I think it's important to understand, uh, you know, and it, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing concept to me. So in order to illustrate how hard it is for T cells, as an example, I'm basically showing you a map. And does anybody know what this map is? This is a New York City underground or subway system. And uh, it's a little bit more, you know, it's, it, it's really an amazing system. But to figure out how to get, for example, I'm at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, which is pretty much located right about here in the Bronx. And we frequently have visitors who are coming from, from all the way in Brooklyn. So you basically have to travel all the way here. The different colors are different subway lines. So you have to know to switch from sub one subway to a different subway to go in the right direction. And it's an amazing process to do. And it's very complicated. And even with this detailed map, knowing where things are, frequently people make wrong turns and get lost, which is not surprising. So imagine what it's like for a T cell being in the body with no map, you know, the T cell doesn't pull, you know, pull out a map, you know, hearts, there's no signs, like, you know, all, you know, an arrow pointing, you know, heart, you know, uh, 15 inches to the left. Uh, and, and, and in addition, the bloodstream's one way. You know, if you miss your, your turn to get into the lymph node, you can't, like, kind of back up, because then you'll be getting hit by oncoming red blood cells, and uh, there's no insurance in the uh, immune system. So it's clearly an incredibly complex process, and the fact that it works is mind-boggling. And the fact that things could potentially go wrong is actually uh, not surprising, but it's amazing how well it works. And so therefore, again, how does that happen? How does antigen get targeted to a T cell expressing the appropriate T cell receptor? That's another amazing concept. You have a, a T cell mixed in with millions and millions of other T cells in the lymph node, and you have an antigen that's on the other end of the lymph node, how do those two come together? I mean, you think about it, the odds of that happening are minuscule, 
And yet, not only does it happen, it happens in a very efficient way. So how, how is that possible? Again, to think about that. And finally, again, this is always a recurring theme in the immune system. On one hand, you want to fight infection, but on the other hand, you don't want to destroy your own cells. You don't want collateral damage happening in, the, in our body. So again, how is T-cell response to self-antigens prevented? Yesterday, we spoke about deletion in the thymus, deletion in the bone marrow, but, any, but anybody here, I'm sure, realizes they can only be so efficient. And you know that if you make a mistake and you let out a self-reactive T-cell, B-cell, the impact is devastating. So you want to have a fail-safe mechanism in order to allow you to delete self-reactive cells after they've left the thymus. So how does that happen? Okay, so this is a, uh, a again, a kind of cartoon of the process, and, I, and I'm going to go into it in more detail as the lecture progresses. The f this basically involves three steps from the time of antigen presentation until the time that the cell is actually doing something. And in this particular case, it's illustrating a cytotoxic T cell behavior. So if we start with the recognition phase, it's very obvious what's going on. This is when the antigen-specific receptor recognizes the antigen that it's specific for. And as you now are all very familiar with, MHC class 1, the antigen presenting cell, peptides being presented to T cell receptor, and now you all know very clearly the signal transduction pathway. One signal is T antigen presenting it was from the T cell receptor, but you also appreciate there's a second signal, and I'm going to be discussing in a little bit of detail later exactly what that second signal is, but just to introduce you to it, it's, it's, it's basically conveyed by two molecules. On the surface of the antigen presenting cell, it's B7, and on the surface of the T cell, it's CD28. Now, again, the way that I remember that is that B7, what cell do you think this was first described in? A B lymphocyte. That's why it's B7, probably like the seventh antigen they detected. And what kind of, in addition to making antibodies, what else do, do B cells do? They, they present the antigen as well. So B, so B7, think of an antigen presenting cell as the one that expresses it. And then CD28, you know, 20 and T cells start with the letter T. Because otherwise you always confuse the two of them. So you always never just, you, know, you think, you know B7, CD28, but now you think B7, B cell, antigen presenting cell, CD28, T cell, that's what's on the T cell. Okay? So we'll go into it in a little more detail later, but these two signals now activate the T cell. It undergoes proliferation because a single T cell can't do much, especially a cytotoxic T cell. A single B cell can actually do a lot because a single B cell can make tons and tons of antibodies. However, because of the fact that the T cell, the cell itself is the effector portion of that uh, limb, you need a lot of cells. So therefore, it has to go a large amount of proliferation. And again, as we'll discuss as the lecture progresses, the major growth factor responsible for T cell proliferation is interleukin-2. And in the second lecture this, this morning, I'm going to be discussing all the different T cell subsets, Th1, Th2, Th17, and Treg cells, and discussing uh, the specific cytokines that they make. But for now, think of IL-2 as the generic factor that stimulates T cell proliferation. Once you have enough T cells available, now you want them to differentiate into effector cells. Clearly, in order to have an effect, the cell has to have specialized proteins. So, for example, in the case of cytotoxic T cells, they have to have the proteins that are necessary for killing cells. So they have to have perforin. They have to have granzyme, granzyme B, in order to kill. And that happens during the differentiation process. It makes sense while the cell's proliferating. It doesn't need to be making those specialized molecules yet, only after you have all the cells available. So again, that's why it's kind of a, a, a process. First they proliferate, and then they start differentiating. And finally, the cytotoxic T cell has effector function. Now that it's fully armed and ready to go, now it will be uh, killing the target cell. Here you have an infected cell. It's presenting peptide from the virus in the MHC molecule being recognized, and then the cytotoxic T cell is killing it. So that's the big picture, and now we're going to kind of hone in on the details of this process. Okay, any, any questions? Okay, so now, uh, again, uh, someone, someone once said that anatomy is destiny. It's an uh, uh, interesting thought, but, uh, you know, just uh, take a little sidebar. This, I have a um, yeah, question. From the previous slide, uh, I don't understand the, the differences between the 
proliferation and differentiation? Okay, the, the question is, what is the difference between proliferation and differentiation? And w the answer I would give is that if you have a single T cell that recognizes antigen, you want to make, say, a million of them. So now, it's, in a sense, you've now made a million of those cells, but those cells are not yet expressing the specialized protein that they need to have their effective function. So, for example, for a B cell, you make a lot of B cells, but until you start having extensive Golgi apparatus, endoplasmic reticulum production, then you're not going to be making the large no amount of antibody that you need to make. So for a B cell, it, it's, it now differentiates into a plasma cell that's making antibody. For a CD8 cell, it, you have large numbers of CD8 T cells, but they don't yet have large amounts of perforin, granzyme B, all the other factors that they utilize in killing cells. That's what differentiation is doing. Okay? So uh, anyway, so if you, if, do you mind if I tell like a little story? Okay, because I know, you know, it's like uh, lectures can be like eating cornflakes with no milk and sugar. It's it very dry. So it's always good to kind of make it a little interesting. So, so this is a, anyone here have kids? Okay, this is, so everyone has kids, right? So, so anyone here a, a medical doctor? Okay, so, so have, did you, have you taught your kids medical stuff? You know, like one of the things doctors do is they, they teach their kids medical stuff because, the, you know, so you, want, you want to show off your kids and you want to kind of surprise people. So what a lot of physicians do is they teach their kids, like, anatomy. So the, 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 the kid doesn't have, like, a, a collarbone. They say it's a clavicle or a sternum. You know, and it's, you know, it's like, oh, my sternum is killing me. And everyone, everyone looks at you like, whoa, your kid's like a walking, you know, and this is like a two-year-old kid. So, but I want to just kind of highlight to you the danger of teaching kids anatomy. That's why it's relevant to this. So, so a few years ago, when, when my old, my, when I had my old, two oldest sons, they, they were then like five and three. So my wife was away, it was a Sunday, and I was in charge. And you have to feed your children because, you know, if kids are hungry, they're cranky. And cranky kids are really hard. Uh, so, uh, but my culinary skills are extremely minimal. So I'm very good at mashing tuna fish, but that's about it. So, so I said to my, you know, uh, my youngest son, I said, what would you like for lunch? And he said, can I have a tuna fish sandwich? I said, fine. You know, I go mash it, put the right amount of mayonnaise in it, and I make him a beautiful sandwich, beautiful presentation. And I hand it to him, and he says, thank you, Daddy. He takes one bite, and he says, oh, Daddy, I'm so full. <laughs> if I take one more bite, my stomach is going to explode. And I said, Akiva, this is ridiculous. You know, you took one bite. You know, how could you possibly fall? No, Daddy, if I take another bite, my stomach's going to explode. I can't take it anymore. My oldest son says, psst, Daddy, come over here. So I walk over to the side, and I always say it's amazing how kids siblings are more than happy to throw their other sibling under the bus. You know, they have no problems like giving, you know, giving them up. So he said, Daddy, I have a great idea. I said, if Akiva is really full, why don't you offer him a chocolate chip cookie? If he says yes, then you know he's not really full. If he says no, well, then he's really full. And I said, no, that's a really good idea. Let me try it out. So I go back to Akiva, and I say, Akiva, do you want a chocolate chip cookie? And Akiva looked at me and says, yeah, Daddy, that would be great. And I said, wait a minute, Akiva. You told me if you took one more bite, your stomach would explode. And now you're telling me you have room for a chocolate chip cookie. How could that be? He looked at me with that look that kids give to parents like they're morons. And he said, Daddy, you don't understand. The stomach is for the main course. The esophagus is for dessert. My stomach is full, but I have plenty of room in my esophagus. So again, the dangers of teaching your kids anatomy. OK, so now we'll go back to anatomy. So this is an uh, a anatomical picture. I guess the esophagus is over here, and the stomach is here, but they're not shown. But the important point to underline here is the fact that the T cells and B cells are anatomically localized based on their differentiation and activation step. So the first place that you're going to be looking at are the primary lymphoid tissues. This is what we discussed yesterday. The T cells are going to be differentiating inside the thymus. That's where they undergo VDJ recombination, development of uh, T cell receptor 
uh, selection of, of both MHC recognition and deletion of self-reactive, and for the, for the B cells, that occurs in the bone marrow. So again, clearly they have to be localized there. However, once the cell has differentiated and now it has the capacity to see antigen and you've eliminated self-reactive cells, you obviously want it to leave the thymus and you want it to leave the bone marrow. And a point that I wonder, want to underline about the thymus that I didn't mention yesterday is the thymus actually is felt to kind of be a sealed environment because you don't want to have infectious agents coming into the thymus. Because if you had infectious agents in the thymus, what kind of T cells do you think you'd be deleting? Antigen-specific T cells that recognize whatever that infectious agent is. And in fact, some of you who take care of kids that have been infected with HIV uh, in utero or at birth know that HIV actually can infect the thymus of these children. And in fact, what happens now is, is that these kids delete their HIV-specific T cells, and that's why a lot of these children have a much more devastating and rapid course of HIV infection than adults do, because already you're pu putting them under a handicap because they're deleting T cells that are specific for HIV. So that's why, for the most part, the thymus is a relatively sealed environment that really prevents the uh, the entry of pathogens into the thymus. However, now the cells differentiate, they leave the thymus, and now they have to go into an environment where they wait for exposure to the antigen that they have pre-programmed to recognize. And again, one of the aspects of doing this is you want to put the T cell concentrated in a location where an antigen is very efficiently brought into that environment. And that location turns out to be all the lymph nodes, in, in all the different lymph node complexes, both mesenteric lymph nodes, uh, peripheral lymph nodes, as well as the spleen. There is a where these cells home to waiting for antigen to be presented to them. And finally, after exposure to antigen, they undergo proliferation. And the majority of the prolifer proliferation occurs in the lymph node. And that's why, for example, when you get an infection and your lymph nodes swell, why do you think your lymph nodes are swelling? For the most part, they're not swelling because they themselves are infected. They're swelling because all these T cells and B cells that are proliferating take up a lot more space than a, a handful of lymphocytes. So that's what's causing the swelling. They are painful because the lymph nodes themselves have pain receptors in their capsule, which is relatively inflexible. And as it stretches, that causes pain. You clear the infection, what happens to the T cells and B cells that are proliferating? They undergo apoptosis, they disappear, and that's why the lymph nodes shrink back down again. So again, that's physically demonstrating the high level of proliferation because you could actually see it macroscopically. Imagine how many cells are involved in that process. But they have to now migrate to the area of any infection. So in the case of someone who picks their nails, the infection potentially is at the tip of their finger. So it has to now get out of the lymph node, get into the circulation, and migrate to, to the, to the, to the um, uh, finger. How does that happen? How does this occur? So a simple kind of way of thinking about it is anybody here ever go on an airplane, fly an airplane? Right? OK. So you go and you check in, and you have luggage. What do you do with your luggage? You hand it over to the people behind the counter, and, and then you hope it's going to end up in the carousel at the place that you're going. Even if you're making two or three transfers, you hope that happens. And actually, usually it does. And it's an amazing that it actually works when you think about it. If you've ever seen what the luggage sorting area looks like, it's even more amazing. But how does it happen? What do they do to allow the luggage to actually make to where it's supposed to go? They put a baggage tag on it. And on the baggage tag, there's a barcode. And they continuously read the barcode. And they kind of shunt it to different directions based on what the barcode says. In essence, that's what cells themselves do. Each of the cells has a barcode. What that barcode, though, turns out to be are these specialized adhesion molecules, one of which has a, a ligand that's uniquely expressed in different anatomical locations. So, Naive T cells express adhesion molecules that specifically target them to secondary lymphoid tissues. So in the case of lymph nodes, that molecule expressed by naive T cells is L-selectin. Now, you may recall that in the case of endothelial uh, adhesion, what molecule was the adhesion molecule there? E-selectin. Remember, E, endothelial cell. L, lymphocyte. So again, that's how you can, you know, immunologists are your friends. So the naive T cell expresses L-selectin, 
And this binds to a molecule that's expressed on the surface of these specialized veins in lymph nodes called high endothelial venules. And these express this molecule called CD34. So this naive T cell is going to be in the circulation. It'll keep on going until it sees CD34 expressed on the surface of a venule. And then it'll stop. And again, I'll show you in a, in a minute exactly what happens. Or another molecule some people have reported called glycam-1. Again, but what you need to kind of remember is naive T cells express L-selectin. And it's going to bind to CD34 on high endothelial venules. You also have to have naive T cells migrate into the mucosal tissue. So for mucosal tissue, there's another molecule expressed on mucosal endothelium called MADCAM. Well, let's think. What does MA stand for? What does M stand for? Mucosal, ad, adhesion, and then it kind of gets a little silly because now it's called cellular adhesion molecule. You know, it's kind of like almost like a, a, a stuttering. But, but, but again, this is really to help you remember what it is. You see it, you can figure out what it is. And it turns out that, that cells express global adhesion molecules because they do have to be a little sticky in order to stick to endothelial cells, but they also express specialized. So as I mentioned before, naive T cells, for example, uh, can recognize specialized one. This is another one called LPAM that's, that's expressed by native T cells, they'll target them to mucosal endothelium. So MADCAM, again, is a mucosal endothelial adhesion molecule, and LPAM has been reported to, to target them to the mucosal tissue. Once the cell becomes activated, it expresses a different molecule, and this molecule called VLA4. And again, VLA stands for very late antigen number four. And the way this was discovered was they activated T cells, and after a few days, these T cells started expressing this antigen. Because it took a few days, they said, oh, this is a very late antigen. It's taken a while. And that's where the name came from. So again, it just helps to remember when you see VLA, think very late, and then that you know that it's expressed by activated T cells. And VLA4 binds to a molecule that you may recall called VCAM1. What do you think the V stands for? vascular cellular adhesion molecule. And it's expressed on activated endothelium. Remember, at the sites of infection, the, the uh, endothelium gets activated, expresses high levels of ICAM-1, but it also expresses high levels of VCAM-1. That's a signal that there's an infection going on. And what kind of cells would you want to recruit if there's an infection? Would you want to recruit naive T cells? No. What kind would you want to recruit? activated T cells. So this is now the kind of barcode that tells activated T cells that there's an infection going on. This is where you have to get recruited to. Okay, is that clear? Now, it, if you look now at the range of T cells in circulation, it turns out that there's some molecules, all of them express, and there's some that are uniquely expressed by activated versus not activated. So now if we start from the first column, L-selectin now, you're all familiar with. What cells are going to express L-selectin? The naive lymphocytes. And again, what they're calling them at, uh, resting. And once they get activated, they don't express it anymore. Well, why do you think you would want them to stop expressing it after activation? What tissue do you want them to leave? The lymph node. So the, the expressing is keeping a lymph node. Activated, you want them to leave. It's like you know, you're, when you're a teenager or whatever, there's a certain time your parents decide to kick you out of the house. That's what happens with these uh, cells, getting kicked out of the lymph node. But now they express VLA4 because that's going to allow them now to home to areas of infection. Do you want naive T cells to go to areas of infection? No. So do you want them to express VLA4? No. So that's exactly what's going on. And other molecules, so LFA1, as you recall, is the global adhesion molecule. And anyone remember what LFA1 binds to? ICAM1. And so you still have, they still have to be sticky. So even, even resting naive cells express some LFA1, but activated cells, you want them to be stickier. So therefore, they actually upregulate the expression of LFA1. And again, the, the other molecules, like CD4, T cell receptor, those all pretty much stay constant. The other one I want to point out to you is CD45 Ra and CD45 Rho. Anyone familiar with that from clinical medicine? Yeah? Memory and naive. Memory and naive. Uh, and 
CD45 Ra is expressed on naive cells, and again, the way to remember it is Ra has the letter A, and naive has the letter A. And Rho is memory, memory has O, and, and Rho has uh, 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 o. So the reason it's important clinically is that individuals who have an activated immune system, they may have autoimmune diseases, they may have infection, they're going to have a lot more memory cells in circulation than naive cells, and it's a routine clinical test. You do basically a ratio of the CD45 rho to ra, and if they have elevated CD45 rho, that's an indication that their immune system has been activated, uh, and therefore you have to start to uh, analyze what the reason for that is. Okay, any questions? Okay, so now we'll hone in on exactly how these naive T cells home to the lymph node. So to orient you, right here is the high endothelial venule. So that's really a blood vessel kind of coming out of the screen at you. The, the lymphocyte is, is basically circulating in this venule, but now it sees CD34, the L-selectin binds to it, it stops, and now the lymphocyte extravasates through diapodesis from the vascular system into the lymph node itself. Now it's in the lymphoid environment, and now this, T cell, this either B cell or T cell has a job because its job now is to see if antigen that it's pre-programmed to recognize is present in the lymph node. So this T cell now will basically move all through the lymph node looking for antigen, and in fact, if it's a T cell, it can't see free-floating antigen, so what kind of cell is it going to interact with? Dendritic cells or maybe macrophages, and it's kind of like, it's like it frisks the uh, dendritic cell. It rolls up and down the membrane, and if you remember, the dendritic cell has this stellate membrane, this stellate appearance, and again, think of it as three-dimensional. It's like one of these balls that have tons of spikes coming out of it, which gives it an incredibly large surface area, which allows it to have a lot of cells at any given time. And again, the simplistic analogy I think about is people here familiar with the story of Cinderella, right? So, so Prince Charming dances with her, and then she has to leave by midnight, and then she leaves behind her slipper, and then she disappears. And now Prince Charming wants to find her. So what does Prince Charming use to find her? The slipper. He goes all through the kingdom, tries the slipper on every girl in, in the kingdom. Now, of course, you realize what a great relationship they've developed, that he needs to see if the slipper fits, if he actually knows it's the right person. You know, otherwise, he wouldn't recognize her. But anyway, uh, <laughs> T cells do exactly the same thing. They basically have an antigen T cell, specific T cell receptor. It uniquely recognizes pept a peptide plus MHC. The T cell goes through the lymph node, going to dendritic cells, seeing if there's, for example, a foot that fits into this antigen recepting uh, slipper. So, and if, but if it doesn't, it, has, it leaves the lymph node and goes on to the next lymph node, the next lymph node, until it potentially finds the antigen that it's pre-programmed to recognize. <laughs> However, if the T cell sees the antigen that it's pre-programmed to recognize, now it, it gets activated, it starts proliferating and makes thousands and thousands, maybe millions of copies of itself, and starts to, to differentiate, and now it downregulates its L-selectin, and now it will leave the lymph node. But instead of homing to another lymph node, which this T cell does because it continues to express L-selectin, this cell now is going to express, for example, VLA4 and other markers that will target it to the peripheral tissue, potentially where there's an infection going on. And now these activated T cells differentiate depending upon what their function is. So again, if they'd be cytotoxic T cells, they would start developing all the proteins they need. If they'd be CD4 helper cells, they start making gamma interferon and other cytokines that they utilize, and now they leave the lymph node to the site of, of infection. So basically to summarize, naive T cells and B cells localized to lymph nodes or mucosal pyrus patches. Antigen activation of these cells requires inter interaction with antigen presenting cells. And again, uh, now you have to have the flip side. The antigen has to get into the lymph node. Otherwise, it's not going to be available for the T cells. You have to have an efficient system to do it. And because of the fact that T cells need antigen presented in the context of an antigen presenting cell, it makes sense to bring it there with an antigen presenting cell. And what cell do you think is going to play a role in that process? Macrophages and dendritic cells. 
And what do you, is a dendritic cell called when it's in the skin? A Langerhans cell. Again, so now we put it together. Oops, wrong way. So now, if we look at what the antigen-presenting cells are available, there are basically three antigen-presenting cells that are the most common ones. So first is dendritic cells. Second is macrophages, and the third one is B cells. Each one of them has unique features that are associated with its functional activity. So the dendritic cells have phagocytic capacity. They also have pinocytic, macropinocytotic capacity. They could actually take in large molecules. And dendritic cells, though, are not designed to be phagocytic cells to kill pathogens. They're more designed, basically, to digest them and also to present uh, antigen. In addition, think about presenting antigen in the context of class 1 MHC. Can typical phagocytosis allow you to present antigen in class 1 MHC? What do you think? Who here says yes? Raise your hand. Who here has says no? Raise your hand. Let's go. Come on, go for it. You got to vote. You're not voting. Okay. Yes, raise your hand that, that, that you can present class 1 just by doing phagocytosis. Raise your hand. Okay. Who says you can't? Raise your hand. Yeah, and then if you're not sure, look around. If everyone else is raising their hand, what the heck, right? But it's you know, got to be involved. So you have to take a stand somewhere. And the answer is, it's not going to happen. So how can you possibly present antigen in the context of class 1 MHC molecule in order to activate cytotoxic T cells? What do you th how do you think you'd have to do it? It'd have to be infected. In fact, as we say in, in America, you have to take one for the team. You know, sometimes you just have to take a sacrifice for the good of the team. And it turns out that the cell that's decided to do that are dendritic cells. And dendritic cells frequently become infected with agents, but they're doing it because they want the infectious agent now to make the viral proteins, and now can present those viral proteins in the context of class 1 MHC to activate cytotoxic T cells. And again, dendritic cells have a lot of other factors that make it extremely resistant itself to being killed by viral infection, so it's semi-protected in that process. But again, that's a major role that dendritic cells play. Now, when dendritic cells are in the peripheral tissue, like Langerhans cells, they have a very high level of, phag of phagocytotic or pinocytotic capacity, which makes sense because they want to suck in antigen. Once they get activated, and, but on the other hand, they have very low expression of co-stimulatory molecules. They aren't expressing high levels of B7. It also makes sense because you don't really want to activate T cells in the peripheral tissue very much because what's the most common antigen in the peripheral tissue? Self or non-self? Self, absolutely. So therefore, if you have activated dendritic cells in the peripheral tissue, what do you think may be, be very likely to happen? What kind of T cells will be activated? Autoimmune self-reactive T cells, because that's the most peptides they're presenting. So therefore, it's, they're not activated at that stage, but once they leave and migrate into the lymph node, they change their functional activity. They become much less phagocytotic because they don't need to pick up antigen anymore in the lymph node, but now they become activated and able to present an uh, and activate T cells because that's what they're going to do in the lymph node. Now, macrophages also present the antigen. They take up the antigen through phagocytosis, but in addition, Macrophages also obviously kill, so they have effector function in terms of eliminating pathogens at the same time that they're important antigen-presenting cells. Now, again, similar to dendritic cells, when they're not activated, they express either no or extremely low levels of co-stimulatory molecules for exactly the same reason. If they're not activated, it's because there's no infection going on. There's no need, therefore, for them to be able to activate T cells because the danger is they'd be activating autoimmune responses. However, once this, they detect an infection, now how can a macrophage detect infection? What molecules does it express that allows it to, to detect infection? Any suggestions? Receptors. What? Receptors. Right, and throw out some receptors. Think fruit fly. Fruit fly. Toll like receptors. Again, that will activate it. Glucan receptors, mannose receptors. When it detects 
the bacteria, it binds to the macrophage, activates it, and then it starts expressing co-stimulatory molecules. It also, both dendritic cells and macrophages also upregulate MHC class 1 and class 2 in the presence of infection. Same concept. If there's no infection going on, you don't need to express a large amount of class 2 or class 1 MHC molecule, again, because you're more liable to present self-peptides. When there is infection, you want a high level of infection. And B cells, again, as I'll show you again later, they take up antigen, but they only do it in the context when antigen binds to the antibody molecule. If antibody doesn't bind to the if, if antigen does not bind to its antibody molecule, the B cell ignores it. Again, B cells are selfish cells. They only want to present antigen if it facilitates its capacity to make antibody. Okay, is that clear? Okay, so these are the three antigen presenting players. And in fact, if you look in the lymph nodes, these are present at different locations. So this is color-coded, this is a dendritic cell, and this is an example of the dendritic cell taking one for the team, getting infected with the virus in order to enable it to present viral peptides in the context of class 1 MHC. It's distributed all throughout the lymph node. What, do you, what cells do you think are in the white zone? B cells, because these are germinal centers. And in fact, B cells are predominantly going to be located in the germinal centers, and T cell and macrophages are distributed all throughout the lymph node, including some macrophages that are also located inside the um, uh, germinal center. Now, I actually have been ignoring B cells because B cells also need to have antigen brought in to, into the lymph node. B cells see antigen in the lymph node, undergo proliferation, and in fact they differentiate into plasma cells and make a lot of antibody in the hilum. So how does antigen get into the, uh, you need to have whole antigen in order for B cells to respond. So one possibility is that, for example, dead bacteria may drain into it, bacterial pieces may drain into it. Dendritic cells also, Undergo, through pinocytosis, pick up whole proteins without digesting it, can bring it into the lymph node and spit it out into the, into the lymph node for B cells to see it. And there's another cell that is in the lymph node called follicular dendritic cells. And follicular dendritic cells, even though they're called dendritic cells, have a different lineage. And their, one of their roles is kind of like flypaper. Anybody here ever see flypaper? You know, in the States, we used to have this where they'd hang these long strips of very, very sticky paper. Do they have that in England? I don't know. Fly paper? Yeah. yeah, same thing. And it's, it's actually, you know, when you're a kid, you love it because every morning you'd wake up and count how many flies you have stuck on the thing. But, so you have a positive, you know, readout. But follicular dendritic cells are the same way. They actually have antigen that sticks to it like flypaper on the outside of the membrane, maintaining the three-dimensional structure of the antigen because that's critical for B cells to recognize it. If it would digest it into peptides, it wouldn't do any good for the, for the B cells. So that also helps, again, efficiently focus the antigen in a way of maintaining three-dimensional structure for B cells to interact. Yes? Can one dendritic cell present more than one antigen at the same time? Okay, the question is, can one dendritic cell present more than one antigen at the same time? What do you think? Absolutely. Why not? And it's a very efficient way. Again, there are thousands of MHC molecules, and it could be presenting thousands of peptides from thousands of different proteins. The overwhelming, if you're not infected, first of all, you're not going to have a lot of dendritic cells in the lymph node if you're not infected because they're going to be staying in the peripheral tissue. But again, the overwhelming amount of peptides probably presented by a dendritic cell are going to be self just because that's the nature of what gets loaded into the MHC. But it, the more severe the infection, the more stuff it's, it's phagocytosed, then more of the farm peptides will be presenting, but absolutely can present peptides from multiple different infectious agents. Okay? Any other questions? What's the size of the dendritic cell relative to the uh, HE lymphocyte? What's the size of a dendritic cell relative to a T lymphocyte? And the dendritic cell is significantly larger. And I don't have a picture of it, but, uh, you know, I can't give you an exact number, but, you, but when you see pictures, you basically will see a T cell looking about that big on one of the processes. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so again, as I said from the, the outset, you need two signals in order to activate a T cell, antigen-specific signal, and a co-stimulatory signal. And it turns out that, as I mentioned before, the co-stimulatory signal is conferred 
by a B7, CD28 interaction, B7 expressed on antigen presenting cells, CD28 on T cells. But in addition, there's also a third signal, which I had also discussed yesterday, which are cytokines. So in order to allow a T cell to undergo its full differentiation capacity, you basically have a, a single, the first signal antigen specificity activates it. You need to have a co-stimulatory signal in order for that T cell to survive. As I'll show you in a few minutes, if you only get activation signal without the co-stimulatory signal, the T cell actually gets turned off permanently and becomes energized. And then you need a third signal, which is the cytokine. And the cytokine is like the fine-tuning signal because that cytokine is going to tell the T cell what type of T cell to be. When it differentiates, what proteins it's going to make, which determines what its ultimate function is going to be, which I'll discuss in more detail in the next lecture, Th1, Th2, Ta17, and Treg. Okay, any questions? Okay, now again, the immune system always has to have a way of turning itself off. So, the, and again, like a car, you have an accelerator and you have a brake. When you need to go fast and you need to move, you turn on the accelerator. When you need to stop, you hit the brakes. So as soon as the immune st stimulation of the T cell started, you already are sowing the seeds for turning that T cell off. And the way that that's done is by the T cells starting to express a, another molecule called CTLA4. And again, CTLA4, cytotoxic T late antigen. So LA, late, so, this, so is this expressed early on or late in the activation? Late. It's another way of kind of reminding you of exactly what it, it does and what, when it's expressed. And in contrast to CD28, which provides the activated T cell with a positive co-stimulatory signal, CTLA4 actually turns off the T cell. Now, let's, I'll throw, based on yesterday's lecture on T cell signal transduction, what class of molecules would you predict CTLA4 would be turning on? Okay. What? Well, let's, okay, let's, think, let's step back. What is the very common molecule that's being turned on during T cell signal transduction and activation? A kinase. Okay, now, so therefore, that turns on. What class of molecules do you think CTLA-4 is going to turn on? Phosphatases, because that's exactly the opposite. If you want to undo a kinase, have a phosphatase. And in fact, CTLA-4 turns on phosphatases, now dephosphorylating all those signal transduction molecules and turning it off. So in essence, what's happening now, how is CTLA-4 able to turn off the immune uh, response even more potently is it turns out that CTLA-4 actually has a higher affinity for B7 than CD28 does. So again, think about, you know, two people grabbing for something, and I'm trying to grab a donut, and Shaquille O'Neal is trying to grab a donut. You know, who has money on Shaquille O'Neal? Absolutely, because he has super high affinity for donuts. Uh, if you've ever seen him, you probably know that's the case. So, so CTLA-4 has a much higher affinity for B B7, so it's going to grab it, get activated, shove B7 out of the way, and now the T cell is no longer going to be getting that positive signal. It's going to be getting turned off, and this is how you start deactivating T cells, which is critical. Again, to, you've, you've eliminated the infection. You don't need these T cells anymore, and also potentially you don't want to have an autoimmune response. And again, there are other molecules, for example, PD-1, which you know about, plays a role such as that. TIM3 plays a role. And in fact, people have published, and, and actually, I believe Bruce published a paper showing that CTLA-4 is overregulated in HIV-infected CD4-positive T cells, and that may be uh, a mechanism, again, by which HIV turns off the immune system prematurely as a way of preventing a full immune response to eliminate HIV infection, okay? Now, as we, he mentioned before, we mentioned before, Langerhans cells play a critical role in bringing antigen into the uh, lymph node. So if there's a cut, bacteria enter, it basically gets taken up, phagocytosed by dendritic cells, chewed up. These dendritic cells, again, at this stage have a high level of phagocytic ability, again, not to kill bacteria, but to be able to present them. Once they've taken this up, 
probably have, as I showed before, toll-like receptor act activation of the dendritic cell because a lot of these bacteria have motifs that activate it. And now it's, it's signaled to migrate, leave the uh, lymph node, and then, and then getting, draining into the lymph, uh, lymphoid, the lymphatics. It goes into the lymph node, now bearing the antigen with it, but now it undergoes maturation, as I'll show you in the next slide, and now it's able to present antigen very, very efficiently to T cells. The T cells that now have migrated into the lymph node from the thymus now can be presented with the antigen that they're pre-programmed to recognize. But in addition, the dendritic cell now has the capacity to deliver a co-stimulatory signal. So, and because now they express high levels of B7, and now these naive T cells can not only see signal number one, which is antigen MHC peptide, but also signal number two, which is B7 CD28. Okay, is that clear? But in the periphery, is the Langerhan cell going to be expressing B7? No, because again, you don't want to stimulate peripheral T cells because your most likely antigen you see there is going to be self antigen. Now, how do uh, another way by which T cells are targeted and dendritic cells are targeted to the lymph node is through expression of CCR7. And right now, I'm going to discuss it for dendritic cells, but in the second lecture, I'll explain the role it plays in memory T cells. So, CC cytokine. C uh, receptor 7 is expressed by dendritic cells after they've been activated, and that's how they know to home to lymph nodes. So again, if you recall, TLR, toll-like receptor, there's also DEC205, other molecules that basically recognize these pathogen-associated motifs that now when the exposed to the bacteria binds to it, it activates it. And now once it's been activated, it induces it to express CCR7. It also allows it to enhance pathogen uh, processing, upregulating expression of co-stimulatory molecules. And so now it starts expressing B7. It upregulates MHC, both class 1 and class 2 expression. And it also expresses CCR7. And CCR7 stimulates it to migrate into the lymph node, particularly into the T cell zone, where now it's available, again, to prime T cells. So now you see the signals that are happening. You have, uh, in this case, maybe. Uh, CD4, again, you see there are two stalks to the MHC molecule, so it's class 2 MHC, as well as the co-stimulatory signal B7 to CD28. Okay? Any questions? Now, nothing is ever simple. And the, one of the rules of immunology is that when a, a cell is first discovered, everybody thinks it's just like this glob of cells that are all the same. But then as people or investigators look more and more carefully at the cells, it turns out there's a significant level of specialization in the cells. So, for example, years ago, everybody thought that there were just T cells. That was all they were. But then people said, oh, CD4, CD8. Now within CD4, you have Th1, Th2, Th3, Th17, uh, uh, Tregs. Same way in dendritic cells, originally people thought there was like one group. Now there's been very well described that there are at least two different types of dendritic cells. Conventional dendritic cells, again, that's a great name because conventional means it's the one you know the most about. Those are designed to be antigen-presenting cells. Classic, so they're going to express high levels of MHC molecules, high levels of ICAM because you want them to be sticky also high levels of co-stimulatory molecules, but there's a second type of dendritic cell called plasma cytoid dendritic cells. They are differentiated through different cytokines and actually may be uh, derived from a lymphoid lineage cells. But the job of a plasma cytoid dendritic cell seems to be to be an antiviral uh, defense mechanism. So in order to be antiviral, it has to make antiviral protein. So all you're familiar with, interferon beta, is being a very common antiviral protein. And how does the plasma cytodendritic cell recognize that it's infected with the virus? It expresses a toll-like receptor 7, which recognizes a motif that viruses typically present. And I, I, I'm not a, it's either, it's, I think it's the double-stranded RNA TLR7 that it does. But again, toll-like receptors to reinforce not only can be expressed on the surface, 
to recognize bacterial motifs. It can also be expressed in the nucleus in order to recognize motifs associated with viral infections, CPG groups that are high in, in, in uh, viral infections, or double-stranded RNA, all are recognized by toll-like receptors. When it, so toll-like receptor 9, I think it's double-stranded, and toll-like receptor 7 is CPG, but again, I'm not 100% and I, that I don't have it memorized well. But now it's infected, it binds to this, and this turns on the dendritic cell, telling it make a large amounts of interferon beta. Okay, any questions? Okay, so now again, uh, I have mentioned before that adhesion molecules are like the barcodes of the immune system, so telling T cells where to go, but in addition, it plays a critical role of T cell antigen presentation interaction. And the reason for that is the affinity between a T cell receptor and MHC peptide, who here thinks that's a low affinity interaction? Raise your hand. So how tightly do you think is the binding between a T cell receptor and MHC plus peptide? Who here thinks that's a very tight binding? Raise your hand. Very tight, tight. Okay, who here thinks it's a very weak binding? Raise your hand. And, you know, just go for it. Just vote, you know? Voting is fun. Okay? So it actually turns out to be a very weak binding. What, why do you think it's weak as opposed to an antibody? What does a T cell receptor undergo to, that would make it a higher affinity binding? What does it undergo? Somatic hypermutation. So therefore, that makes an antibody higher affinity, but T cell receptors don't do that. So therefore, in order for the cell, now the antigen presenting cell comes next to the T cell, the antigen uh, MHC plus peptide TCR bind, it's very weak. So otherwise, they're going to come apart. And they're going to come apart before you can have the whole signal transduction pathway, and then not going to do any good. So you need to have expression of other molecules on the cell surface that speci non-specifically make them stick to each other longer. <coughs> And it turns out these are adhesion molecules. This is something that antibodies don't have the luxury of having. That's why their receptor has to be such high binding. But T cell receptors can take advantage of this because it's cell-to-cell -cell interaction. And the major player uh, that I'll focus on is the interaction LFA1 expressed by T cells and ICAM1 being expressed by antigen-presenting cells. And again, you should be aware that these adhesion molecules are relatively promiscuous. They're not expressed only by one type of cell. They're expressed by endothelial cells, they're expressed by antigen presenting cells, they're expressed by T cells, and, and, and because they have the same function, making the cells stickier. Now, it makes sense, after the cell's been activated, it should become even stickier. And in fact, this is exactly what happens. So initially, the T cell comes in contact with the, the antigen presenting cell. It has low level interaction between LFA1 and ICAM just to bring them together long enough to query the antigen presenting, the TCR, MHC peptide to see if it actually binds and matches. If it doesn't, the T cell says goodbye, goes on to the next antigen presenting cell or the next molecule. So, what frequently happens, you ask can a dendritic cell present more than one antigen? A lymphocyte may actually roll along the dendritic cell, along the membrane, kind of seeing if anywhere is an MHC molecule that it recognizes. It's like frisking. It's like now you go into the airport, they all do a pat down, right? They do it in South Africa, you know, in America, and I don't want to tell you they do it in America, but, you know, so that's what a T cell is doing to the dendritic cell. It's doing a pat down to say, is there a foreign peptide on you that I recognize? If it doesn't, it moves on to the next. If it does, then you get the whole activation process going on. Once it's been activated, now it signals the LFA1 molecule to change its conformation, and the change in the conformation increases its affinity, makes it bind tighter, because now you want the antigen presenting cell and the T cell to stay bound to each other to allow the full signal transduction process to unfold. Is that clear? It's a very elegant, nice system. Okay. And so high-level expression of B7 by dendritic cells permits them to activate naive T cells. Here you have a CD20, here you have a CD8 T cell. It's infected with the virus. Peptide MHC TCR, CD28, B7 expression. The infection potentially upregulated B7. And now this CD8 T cell is activated. It makes in its own interleukin-2 or it may use interleukin-2 from a neighboring cell, and now it gets, starts proliferating and differentiating into a killer cell. Now, if you 
don't see the co-stimulatory signal, then you undergo something called energy. So if basically you get co-stimulatory signal alone, there's no effect on T cell function. Just nothing happens at all. However, if you have MHC, in this case class two peptide, TCR, but no second signal, because the presenting cell turns out to be a tissue cell, not an activated antigen presenting cell, then the sequela is energy. And this turns out to be a very powerful way of eliminating self-reactive T cells in the periphery. Why? Because, and this is a classic infectious situation, dendritic cells activates the CTL2 signals, it now gets activated. Once it's activated, it basically is licensed to kill. And this is a, another critical point to appreciate, very important. Once a cytotoxic T cell is activated appropriately by a dendritic cell, it no longer needs another co-stimulatory signal, which means now if it sees an infected cell presenting foreign peptide in MHC class 1, it doesn't have to also see CD28, it doesn't have to see B7 anymore. Now it will just kill the cell. That makes sense because otherwise you'd never be able to kill a peripheral cell which doesn't express B7. So once it gets the activation signal, it's basically now licensed to kill even if it only sees MHC plus peptide alone. Is that clear? It's a very important concept. However, if the T cell sees antigen for the first time, T cell receptor MHC plus peptide, and does not get a co-stimulatory signal, then it doesn't, not only doesn't it get activated, but it becomes anergic, which means even if it sees the signal at the appropriate manner, it doesn't get activated anymore. It basically becomes castrated, for, is a you know, way of saying it. So, so why is that important? Because let's say this T cell is one that recognizes an albumin protein, for example. Okay? It somehow snuck out of the thymus. It like, left when no one was looking. Now it's in the periphery. If it would get activated, it potentially would be a very potent autoimmune response. However, since it, it now sees albumin peptide for the first time in a non-antigen-presenting cell, which makes sense because there's a lot more of those than there are antigen-presenting cells. What's going to happen now is it gets this, the first signal, doesn't get the second signal, and now gets energized. Or in the absence of underlying infection, as I'll show you in, in, in the next slide, again, even macrophages and dendritic cells don't express co-stimulatory molecules, and they'll also energize. So, and now in terms of uh, adhesion molecules, they also play a role in CD8 CTL immune surveillance, and this is really important when you think in terms of HIV infection, because the, the initial interaction between the CTL and cells is basically made by these nonspecific adhesion molecules, which enables the cytotoxic T cell to roll along the surface of these epithelium, again, doing a pat down of the epithelial cells, like a security agent, saying, are there any foreign peptides in any of the MHC molecules that I recognize? This cell has already been activated by two signals by a dendritic cell. If there's no antigen-specific interaction, nothing is found on the path down, the cytotoxic T cell just keeps rolling along. However, if it does see a foreign peptide during the path down, then it immediately provides the appropriate signals to kill the cell because it assumes the cell is infected. Okay, is that clear? And once it becomes activated, cytotoxic T cells become serial killers. They basically roll along the epithelium, they kill, and as opposed to like a bee, for example, that could only sting once and then dies, cytotoxic T cells are more like hornets or snakes. They could, they could sting and sting and sting and keep going, which is, when you think about it, an amazingly powerful immune-mediating cell because this cytotoxic T cell potentially could go on and infect and kill hundreds of infected cells, prevent those cells from releasing more virus. So you also appreciate why having a cytotoxic T cell that recognizes self can be so devastating because a single cell, if it recognizes a self peptide, could roll along epithelium and just wipe out a whole large number of them. So again, that's why the, the need for eliminating these self-reactive cytotoxic T cells is so critical. And as I mentioned before, the requirement for co-stimulation prevents the induction of, in this case, CD4 response to self.
So in this situation, you have a non-bacterial protein antigen, likely a self. So this macrophage takes up albumin, puts it on its surface, presents it in class 2 MHC molecule, but this macrophage is not activated. There's no bacteria around to activate its toll-like receptors or, or mannose receptors. There's, there's no gametophyrin being produced. It's basically a state of peace, no co-stimulatory molecules. Therefore, this T cell gets energized. If this bacteria comes in contact, if this, if this macrophage comes in contact with bacteria, that's going to activate it, upregulate co stimulatory molecules, and now when it presents peptide, it's able to provide two signals because it upregulates its B7, and now it activates the T cell. Is that clear? However, how can this system go wrong? How could a macrophage be fooled into presenting a self reactive peptide? Well, let's put these two scenarios together because there's a lot of proteins floating around. So let's say you have a macrophage, you have a macrophage that is exposed to bacteria and it gets activated, but at the same time, it takes up a self-protein. This is where the system breaks down because now what happens is that the macrophage got activated because it took up the foreign protein bacteria, but now when it takes up the self at the same time, it's expressing co-stimulatory molecules, right? So now it could present self-reactive peptides and provide the appropriate co-stimulatory signal to a self-reactive T cell and activate it and potentially cause autoimmune disease. So that is why frequently autoimmune diseases are precipitated in the face of an infectious process. A lot of times, they're triggered by an infection because this is how things can get messed up. Or they get triggered when there's tissue damage. When there's tissue damage, you also activate macrophages, and then you could get self-peptide presented inadvertently in the context of a co-stimulatory signal. Is that clear? Just to make you aware, that interleukin-2 receptor has two kinds of affinities. One's a low-level moderate. The interleukin-2 receptor is three chains, the alpha chain, beta chain, and gamma chain. When it only expresses the beta and gamma, it's a moderate affinity, requires a large concentration of IL-2 to bind it and activate it. However, once the T cell is activated, it expresses all three chains and now binds to interleukin-2 with very high affinity. And this is just showing that when, in the absence of infection, it, it only expresses the moderate affinity interleukin-2 receptor and requires high concentrations of interleukin-2 when there's a rip-roaring infection around and a lot of interleukin-2 being expressed in order to be activated. However, when it, it's in, when it gets activated, it expresses all three chains and now even responds to low levels of interleukin-2. And at, in the next lecture, again, I'll go into more detail into what cytokines Th1 cells express. So it's just like I have scenes for the next lecture. And so now the question is to consider, how do T cells know where to go? So we discussed that is dependent upon selective expression of adhesion molecules. Immature, naive T cells express one group of adhesion molecules. When they mature, they lose those and express a different group of adhesion molecules. And, that, and, and different tissues express different adhesion molecule receptors to target them. How does the antigen get targeted to a T cell? Again, dendritic cells come into the lymph node from the periphery, and T cells come into the lymph node, and that's where they meet. How is a T cell response to self-antigen presented? Again, we, I spoke about how in the absence of getting a co-stimulatory signal, T cells are energized in the periphery, and therefore if a T cell got out, C self-antigen, then now it gets uh, energized when it's presented by a, by a non-antigen-presenting cell or an inactivated antigen-presenting cell.